Picture this. Matt Damon, Emily Blunt, Mr. Spock himself, Leonard Nimoy, and Don Schechter, four giants worthy of their pictures in the Sunday art section of the Boston Globe. There you go. Them and me. That's all you need to know, right? My face, their faces, done. That's an image I've been sharing since 2015. Just don't look too closely. Just associate them with me. If you do look closely, you'll see that it describes me as a local filmmaker who showed a short film at a festival up in Vermont, and that that photo of me was submitted by me. I'm the one who contacted the reporter out of the blue. But forget you heard me admit that, because this is my TEDx talk, and I'm here to discuss my expertise. The question is, what am I an expert in? I suppose I've always wanted to be an expert in science fiction. As a kid, I consumed every old sci-fi film and TV series at Blockbuster. Years later, I self-produced and directed a science fiction anthology series, which was based on a script I wanted to sell to Hollywood. Then my manager suggested that if I wrote a book series, I'd have a clearer path to a TV show. So I finished the first novel. I've done everything completely backwards with this project, so my expertise must lie elsewhere. How about teaching? I've been a teacher since graduate school, taught computer skills at an elementary school, though I never took an education class. I coached a string ensemble for a prestigious music program, but I've never been able to safely tune a violin. I co-taught college-level media production courses, then fast forward 15 years, and I'm a professor. But I'm not a real professor. I'm a part-time professor in the film and media studies program. And I don't have a PhD, unlike my mother, brother, and wife. So I'm a part-time professor of the practice with only a master's degree in music that teaches film. So let's move on. Ah, I'm an expert in business. Nearly 20 years ago, I founded Charles River Media Group, a production company lucky enough to grow during the Great Recession and the recent pandemic. When you walk the halls of my studio, you'll see the faces of even more celebrities that I've worked with. Though not on a movie or TV set, I interviewed them at a local event. Most of my colleagues went to film school. I didn't. I also don't have an MBA, so what am I doing here? I'm 41, and I've been an entrepreneur, producer, professor, author, director, editor, consultant, flute teacher, conductor, math tutor, IT specialist, and the list goes on. All of that proves that I'm not an expert in anything, right? I'm really a phony, a fraud, an imposter. And there it is. Succeeding while being, or in spite of being, an imposter. Now that's something I think we can work with, and something many of you can relate to. Think about a moment when an opportunity arose when you were challenged with a task, a task that you knew you had limited abilities or knowledge of how to accomplish. How did you respond? Did you shy away and say, let the experts do that? Or did you say, I think I can, I think I can, I think I can. Embracing that gray area between being an expert and knowing nothing, now that is what I'm here to talk about. And hasn't everyone felt like an imposter at some point? When you think you know nothing and everyone around you knows everything, or that what you know isn't nearly enough and everyone else knows more, or could do it better than you, or they deserve to have it and you don't. Guess what? We all feel that way sometimes and that is what it is, a feeling a thought, and one that we can control with the stories we tell ourselves and others. So it's important to understand the fundamentals of what makes a good story, and then explain your own life through story to combat the biases of others that we may have also internalized. Compelling storytelling is the antidote to imposter syndrome. So how do we create compelling stories? Well, stories are often kicked off by mystery. Questions such as, why are those people trapped on that island? Where did that monster come from? And in Star Wars, who are Rey's parents? These particular questions come up in the work of director J.J. Abrams. And I think we can all agree that he is a master at setting up mystery, whether that's in Lost, Star Wars, Star Trek, Fringe, Super 8, and so on. In one of the classes I teach, 
we spend an entire class dissecting a TED Talk given by J.J. Abrams, where he details his lifelong love of mystery. At the end of one semester, I received this review from one of my students. Who are you to critique J.J. Abrams when he makes so much more money than you? After reading that, I questioned myself. Who am I to critique a, such a successful filmmaker? But it's not about money or his success. It's about his obsession with mystery. He romanticizes that moment when the lights go dark and the movie's about to begin, and all the possibilities of story that can exist. A dive into his work reveals narratives that lack significant development and follow through. He doesn't seem to care about resolving a majority of the mysteries. Indeed, he says that there are times when mystery is more important than knowledge. And though that's often true, after committing their time and money to your story, audiences crave meaningful resolution. We need to keep fueling mystery with increasingly relevant information to engage the audience. We forget everything that we learn starting the moment after we learn it. Information needs to be continually retrieved, essentially reconstructed in our mind over and over to achieve deep learning. Now let's apply storytelling to this concept. We can introduce a mystery, but if we place how much we value the story, how much we are engaged in the story on the y-axis, then what happens is that the audience's interest diminishes over time. Though additional mysteries or clues to the first mystery might replenish interest, it's ultimately fleeting. We do need mysteries to engage us, but the story must be driven by conflict, typically an external threat. The big, bad outside challenge to our characters, the war, the asteroid, the villain, or the systemic failures of a society. And a truly compelling story aligns an external threat with the character's internal conflicts, their flaws, hesitations, or fears. It's the journey of conquering one to resolve the other that is vital to good storytelling. Instead of thinking about the story as a series of peaks and valleys, it is a constant movement forward. So what does this have to do with combating imposter syndrome? We need to create a compelling personal narrative to overcome feeling like we're imposters. Think of life as embedded with pivotal moments that you can package into one story to explain how you are who you are and why you want what you want. Articulate and explore questions whose answers may or may not be immediately obvious to you or others. Who are you? What do you want? What do you do? What can you do? And what's next? If we don't know where to begin, perhaps imposter syndrome itself is our internal conflict. The external conflict is unique to our situation, our context, our job, our family situation, or the world around us. Identify actual strengths and gloss over weaknesses. That will give us the space to tell a compelling narrative. Now, it's not an easy thing to do. It's so easy to get caught up in our own insecurities and flaws and not lean on our strengths because imposter syndrome tricks us into overvaluing the skills of others. Remember that Globe article? My strength was having the connections and taking the risk to pitch my work. My weaknesses sat in the details, but I didn't let those details take over the headlines. Remember, everyone sees and usually only remembers the headlines. If storytelling is the first step, what might the second be? Have you ever seen the show Shark Tank? The most successful entrepreneurs on that show are not always the ones with the best product or service, but they have a well-developed story and a healthy dose of enthusiasm. Even President Obama struggled with imposter syndrome during law school, and he wrote, enthusiasm makes up for a host of deficiencies. Enthusiasm projects confidence in our abilities, even when you're not quite so confident. I believe his campaign's embrace of the yes we can and fired up ready to go refrains actually led to a greater chance of success because it helped mask potential uncertainty in his first improbable run for president. 
However, there's nothing inherent about being enthusiastic that propels us to succeed. Instead, increase your comfort with risk-taking or smart gambling. Remember that laundry list of jobs I had? Well, I was also an amateur poker and blackjack player. In both games, when done right, we need to be patient, ascertain when we're in a good position, and then push the chips forward. It's easy to freeze or expect to lose, but with experience and knowledge, we can calculate the odds and make the best decision based upon the known situation in front of us. We have to be willing to gamble to win. Outside of the casino, things are messier, and we need to try and create, and sometimes force, opportunities to build our skills and combat imposter syndrome. Yet learning new skills to succeed with new opportunities is hard. I often allow my students to fail. Now, not by giving them a bad grade, but by letting them make the mistakes that I know they're going to make so that they learn from them. My students might struggle with a production assignment, but in tackling unexpected challenges, additional skills that are often more valuable in the long term may be learned. After teaching this way for over a decade, I was relieved to learn that this is a real education technique called productive struggle. Productive struggle works great when it's not a life or death situation. Which brings me to Star Trek. In Star Trek, the captain has historically been the hero of the story. But why is that? The captain isn't the master engineer, the strongest warrior, or elite pilot. Captains typically don't have the knowledge to save the day. It's the people that surround them that are key. The specialists with the expertise. There will always be someone smarter, stronger, or more skilled. But that shouldn't stop us from facing the unknown. Let's reframe our imposter syndrome graphic so instead of being intimidated by others, we become their leader, or at the very least comfortable in the company of people smarter than us. And so our third step is to surround ourselves with experts, people we trust who know more than us. On Star Trek, the captain has the final say, takes the credit for the victories and the responsibility for failures. When facing that unknown nebula, do we plunge ahead into the unknown, send in a probe, take the longer and safer path around it, or do we go home? The captain is an expert in looking around the bridge and soliciting expert advice and just making a best guess. Finally, be open to the opportunities in front of you and push yourself to seek them out. My father often told me, get the deposit, figure it out later. Even if you don't think you have the expertise or the skills now, and this is not a pep talk, it's very likely that you don't have all the skills you'll need. But if you trust in yourself that you are that resourceful captain and can build that team, then you stand a good chance of surviving to fight another day. Don't let perfection or some notion of being the expert impede you from saying yes. When you stand in front of a mirror, you're the one interpreting what is reflected back. You're the only one who can see it that way. An imposter syndrome can warp that view. A strong personal narrative colors the lens with which people see us and how we see ourselves. There comes a time when you look into the mirror and you realize that what you see is all that you will ever be. And then you accept it or you stop looking in mirrors. Now, this quote was mistakenly credited to Tennessee Williams and then copied and pasted across the internet for over 15 years. It's really written by my favorite author, J. Michael Straczynski, and spoken from a character named Londo in the 1990s space opera TV show Babylon 5, and Londo looks like this, which maybe explains why he doesn't want to look in a mirror. No, you can't always change what you look like. You can change your narrative, your story. Another character from Babylon 5 says, Understanding is a three-edged sword, your side, their side, and the truth. I believe that identity, who you are privately and publicly, is that same three-edged sword standing in front of the mirror. You are the reflection you see, the image you project, 
and the dynamic truth. So let's recap. How do we overcome imposter syndrome? How do we say yes when fear makes us want to cling to the status quo? And how do we project strength in our reflection? We start by telling compelling stories about our own lives. We unravel and resolve mysteries and reflect past mistakes into current strengths. And we tell these stories enthusiastically. We keep a trusted group of experts and advisors in our orbit. We take risks, learn new skills, and say, yes, we can. We create our own headlines and find a way to reflect our best self. We might even push ourselves to present a TEDx talk, but make sure to do so on our own terms, filmed and edited with the lights and comfort of our own studio. And we finally say, what's next? Thank you.